Willard Rimmer was born on May 3, 1921 in St. Peter, Illinois. He later moved to Mount Pulaski. Rimmer received only an eighth grade education. He was drafted into the Army on July 21, 1942. He served in the 36th Tank Battalion in the 8th Armored Division. He began his training at Scott Air Force Base in O'Fallon, Missouri. He began his service as a T-5 Corporal. He opens with the description on the way he felt immediately after being drafted. Well, yeah, I was like everyone else. I was scared and you know what I mean. I didn't know what I was getting into and what I was going to have to do. While at Scott Air Force Base, Rimmer's training consisted of the traditional Army conditioning. He described some of this training from his own experiences. Maybe we'd have a 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 pound pack to put on our back. We'd maybe march five miles one day, next day it'd be 10 miles, and the next day it'd be 20 miles. It made a man out of me because I would never done calisthenics. I wouldn't eat the proper food. I'd just eat snacks like kids do now. At the beginning of a military career, recruits would take a placement test in order to determine if they were qualified for officer candidate training. Remert describes this test in his own words. You have to take a test when you go into service. It's a, I don't know what you call it, but they got blocks and stuff. And you have to make a pyramid out of them. And then they got a picture of a pyramid. You got to figure out how many blocks are in that pyramid. And if you can press, press so, I get so much grade, you become an officer. Well, I, I went with four guys, and three of them went to high school. One guy went to college, and I didn't go to nothing but eighth grade. Now I got the highest score of them all. So I was supposed to go to OCS school, and I said, no way, no way. I'm not going to become an officer. I come in the Army as a private. I can go out as a private, too, because I don't want to give orders. No, I want to, I'll take them, but I don't want to give them. Any break from the military life was a great relief to any soldier. While on leave, families could reconnect, friends could spend valuable time together, and all the worries of the military life could melt away. Remert describes what he would do while on leave. Well, on leave I'd come home, but I only got two leaves. All the while, I'm four years of service, and I got two leaves. One to come home. Like I said, I spent a day and a half traveling, coming home, and a day and a half going back. And then when I got a discharge, that was it. That was all the leave I had. I didn't get like they do now. I get a seven-day pass. That was a seven-day pass. A little piece of paper. Said, seven o'clock. Back. Be back. Twenty-four hundred hours. I'd say twelve o'clock midnight. It'd be twenty-four hours you get. Rimmer also recalls the day he learned he was heading overseas from his boot camp. The colonel come around there and said, "Mr. Rimmer, I said, "What's the matter?" He said, you didn't look at the board lately, did you? I said, no, why? Look at the boat board. I went out there and looked at the board. He said, congratulations, you're going to go over to Germany. And he said, you won't have no family, you won't have no friends, you won't have nothing, you don't know where you're going or nothing else. Remmert was assigned to the 8th Armored Division, which he explains here. 8th Armored Division. 8th Armored Division. Yeah, that's what the 8th Armored stands for, 8th Armored Division. We were called Thundering Her. <laughs> This is a book all about the 8th Armored Division. Remmert later recalls his role in the 8th Armored Division. Well, I haul, I was hauling it. You were? I was hauling ammunition and gas and water. I had 14 trucks. 14 trucks. And uh, we was hauling for the 8th Armored Division. Remmert recalls his duties in the 36th Tank Battalion. One particular memory is learning how to stay warm in the dead of winter. Take your shoes off and stuff them full of straw. So I come out there and flat. Well, you, SOB, what the? Doing with it, I started cutting. I don't want to do that, what he did. What are you doing? And I told him what I'd done. And I said, My feet are warm, they feel, feel it outside. He said, well, You got it full of straw. I said, Where'd you get it? I said, That's all that straw stack down there. During his service, Remert saw a great deal of combat. Out of all his memories, however, one particular battle stands out. Bottom over there in the Battle of the Bulge. That was the worst war I've ever seen in my life. Remmert then recalls his overall experience, such as his few minor injuries. I had a lot of gunshots, a lot of shrap metal, but I picked out the shrap metal and I'm hard hearing my left ear on account of that, but I, uh, I don't regret it, but I wouldn't give a billion dollars to go through it again. No way. No way, Jose. No way. 
Remmer recalls his duties such as guarding prisoners or soldiers that went AWOL. I carried my gun and I'd say halt. They wouldn't halt, I'd fire one shot above their head and they'd stop right now. So they know the next one's going to be in their leg. We never shot to kill them, but we'd stop. stop. That was what we taught. You stop, you, if you want to serve your time, or his time. I want to serve my own time. <laughs> <laughs> While in Europe, Remmert served under the famous General Patton and shares his thoughts and feelings about him. General Patton was an SOB. Really? You took orders or else. After his service in the Army, Remmert was working on a Jeep while still in Europe, where he met up with General Patton again. I'll do the blanket blanket as much as I want to. I own this blankety blank place. I, I called her, I said, if you own this blanket place, you fix this car for her, because I quit. I wouldn't go take that custom for her. I said, I took enough of that in the Army, and I'd be damn if I'm going to take it now. He says, you can't do that. I said, the hell I can't. So I just don't, like the instrument said, I just don't. <laughs> I quit. They hit him broadside and killed him. And he was in his Jeep. He was driving in there, and he, they hit him and killed him. Smashed that Jeep to tin can, boy. But, uh, oh boy, I can't remember some of them guys. Andy Devine was our our main man when well, we was over there, but then Pat was in charge of all of us. I mean, he was in charge of me and man. Remmer recalls the places he traveled while in Europe. Oh, gee whiz. I went through, all through France and Belgium and Holland. I got into Germany, Switzerland. That's about it. I went all through Europe. Remmert was a very religious man, and while he was in Germany, he was able to go to the Wittenberg Church, where he got to see the translated Bible by Martin Luther. Dr. Martin Luther King translated the Bible at Wittenberg, and I was in Germany at Wittenberg, and I went there, and I got the Bible translation right up there in the church, at the big Lutheran church in Wittenberg, Germany. While in Europe, Remmert not only fought to serve his country, but also met the love of his life. She was a postmistress in the post office, and I was mailing some letters home, and I looked at her, and she looked at me, and mango! <laughs> there, love at first sight! <laughs> I says, can you speak English? She says, sure I can. <laughs> I says, I got to learn, I had to learn seven languages because she was a postmistress in the post office. Remmer also remembers his favorite food while in Europe, a horse steak, which was served to him by his father-in-law. But there's one thing I loved, and as soon as I got, I didn't like it at first, but I didn't know what it was. And as soon as I got over there, the first thing Dad said to me, Butch, they always call me Butch. Hey Butch, Mary Louise, you ready for your horse steak? I said, I'm ready any old time, let's go. That horse steak is delicious. Oh, it beats any beef or any pork, it beats moose, beats bear, it beats anything I've ever eaten. It's tender and it's good. Remmert remembers some unusual events, such as the German jets that the Americans called Bed Check Charlie. Over there I did, I met, met Chuck Charlie, he was a German, they were fine with it. We didn't have him at that time yet, but the Germans had a uh, jet, and you'd hear him coming, and the next thing you hear is the rabbit, da, 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 he'd strafe us, try to get as many men as he could. We called him Bed Chuck Charlie, because every time you get ready to go to bed, he'd fly over that they call him that check Charlie because that jet engine you hear it here to come you know you hear a jet engine real fast. Yeah. But he just like that, he was down over. But all the time he was on it, that ground next morning was had holes in it. And, whew, it was always thank good Lord we was in a safe building. For some, the war wasn't all serious. Rimmer recalls some pranks that soldiers would play on others for fun. They pull pranks on, they'd pour cigarette lighter fluid around there. So he was a guy sleeping, and then he saw a master up and let it light and give him a, see how quick he could kick all his shoes. I never done that. I never I never played any tricks on nobody. I never did, but I got one by mistake. Guy didn't know what to do. You know what? That poor guy had to do over duty. Remmert saved as many lives as he could while in Europe. He recalls one moment that he saved his best friend's life. 
he stopped and then he pulled him out of the tank and I took my belt off and pulled it around his hip. And I said, well, everyone good luck and God bless you. You serve your time now. I didn't think he'd ever make it. Years after the war, Remert ran into the same man while in Springfield, Illinois. And he said, Remert, what, the, what were you doing here? He said, I, I said, I'll be son of a gun, you're on crutches. You're walking. Yeah, he said, thanks to you. He said, I saved my leg, but I got to use a crutch. I can't walk without a crutch. I was never so happy in my life to see him and what he was to see me. You know what I mean? He saved his life by taking my belt off and putting it around the top of the mm -hmm. Try to help everybody you can and save many lives you can. But don't take as many as you can. I never did. I, I met Senator and throw him in the back of the truck, haul him down there, let him take, put him in the guard house. After serving in Germany, Remmert recalls his time in Alaska in which his favorite memory was the scenery, such as the spruce trees. We were supposed to go to the South Pacific, and we ended up in Alaska. And we, they have them spruce trees up there, beautiful. Oh, they they got needles on about this long. So we crawled underneath them, them evergreen trees and crawled in our sleeping bag and just slept like a baby. Entertainment was a frequent aid to the men and women in the military. Many celebrities would fly great distances in order to do their part for these hardworking people. Remmert saw a few of these celebrities himself. Yes, Bob Hope and Francis Langford and Jerry Colonna came out there to Alaska. And it was so foggy that night, they couldn't see the land. And I was in a searchlight battalion. And big searchlights that threw right up near. And I got on the telephone, I cranked up the old telephone, I got on the telephone, and I said, uh, to the radio man, I said, can you get a hold of Kelowna, Jerry Kelowna and Bob Hope and them in that plane? He said, yeah. He said, do. I said, I tell you, just turn them to follow this big spotlight. I'll turn it on. And he was right over me. And I hit him and I said, well, you just follow my light and I'll take you over to Fairfield where you can land. And they did. They landed. But anyway, they took me out and showed me a good time, all for them. While stationed in Fort Richardson, Alaska, Soldiers noticed that something was getting into their trash. In order to solve the problem, the men were ordered to find the creature and shoot it. The animal turned out to be a black bear, and after the soldiers killed it, they discovered it had two cubs. So we went out and started hunting for the bears. And we hunted and hunted, and we found a little brush pile there, and I hollered the guys, said, come here, let's look at what we got in here. So we went in there, sure enough, we found two little bears. They were about four, they were four inches long, we measured them. We call one Franklin and one Ellen, the male and female. So he took pictures of them and sent them to Franklin and Franklin Roosevelt and his wife. And two months later, we got a certificate, a birth certificate, of Franklin the bear and the owner of the bear. And Franklin slept with me on my bed upstairs. And he had a 90-day wonder. He come up the stair steps and Franklin was laying a foot on my bear. He resorted, was going to resort to let me know. Frankie went, ah, and he took off. He went down that stair steps. He didn't open the screen door. He just went right through that screen door. <laughs> he said, there's a bear up there. We said, he's, no, he's on Remmer's bed. Don't touch Remmer, but if you do, you lose your arm. He said, I found that out. That's how come I'm down here, and he's up there. <laughs> he was, well, a friend of mine. There nobody could touch me. Nobody could touch me. Nobody lay a hand on my shoulder or nothing. No, oh, I that was the best friend I ever had, boy. The good times he had in Alaska were coming to a close as he prepared to ship out for his next assignment. Fortunately, before he departed, the war ended. He distinctly recalls this day. Now, I was getting on a ship when the captain came there and he said, boys, you can get off our ship before it's over. Remert then recalls his train ride back to Chicago where he found a ride home with a traveling salesman. You're in for so duration of war six months. And when my duration was over with, it's hard to come around and tell you, I you get to go home now. And I got to come, uh, I sent to a camp, Fort Sheridan, in Chicago. And I shipped out from Chicago. And the thing of it is, I had to take a train to, I see if I took a train. The only train I could get, I couldn't get the Green Diamond to come to Pulaski. I had to take a train from uh, town, a little town out west of here, I can't remember the name of the little town. 
There was a salesman, Melco Independent Oil Company. Was there to pull a duffel bag out of, off of the train, you know what I mean? And he came over there and said, Soldier, where do you live? I said, Mount Plasky. He said, I live in Lincoln. Come on, hop in the car. So just uh, my duffel bag full of clothes and stuff. Pull out the front door. Got me out the front door. Mom and Dad didn't know it. I rang the doorbell. And Dad sent me, he started crying. <laughs> yeah, he was happy for me. Yep. Yeah, that day don't tell you nothing. According to Rimmert, readjusting to the civilian life was just as hard as adjusting to the military life. It was, it was. Yes, it was. I say, uh, Dad, pass me the potatoes, please. I had to learn to say please or thank you. It wasn't up to damn potatoes. <laughs> and Dad said, get out of here. <laughs> I had very religious and strict people. He said he'd give you a lot of orders. And you better take orders too. Because who wants to do KP? <laughs> no, I don't do KP. Remert recalls the hardest part about being in the military. Being away from home. That's the hardest part. Being away from your family and friends, you know what I mean. Last year, Remmert received a letter about the 8th Armored Division's 60th anniversary. He later received a call from his grandson. And he said, uh, Grandpa, I think Dad and I are going to take you to Louisville, Kentucky for your 60th anniversary. I said, what do you mean? He said, Dad, didn't you see that? And you got the I said, yeah, I got the book. He said, this is your last anniversary you're going to have with 8th Armored Division. Go see some of your old buddies. Could not very many of my buddies alive anymore. Remert goes on to tell about one of the numerous medals he was awarded while in Europe. They're in the front room, They're hanging up there in the box. Go we'll take a look at them. Yeah. Medals all. I got a. We got a oak reef cluster from President de Gaulle. Remert finally shows his gratitude towards God and helping him through the war and being able to live as long as he has. So you can see, good Lord, be good to me. I'm 80, 88 years young. So anybody who lives over 88 is doing pretty cotton picking good. The Lord's been good to me. <laughs> yes, he has. Willard Remmert served his country just like any other soldier, with loyalty, courage, and selflessness. He fought in many battles, suffered several hardships, and delivered supplies to the men on the lines of battle. Through the account of his personal experiences, we can peer through the window of time. We can get a taste of what it must have been like to live during this global conflict. Every interview of a World War II veteran is a golden opportunity to preserve a piece of American history. Eyewitnesses' account of events are always the best. They give the stories of details, emotions, and life that would have otherwise been lost forever. The men and women of this generation gave so much to their country. We, as the next generation, need to do our best to remember them and to preserve their memories. We would like to thank Mr. Remmert for allowing us to interview him and to use his home as the interview location.